Okay, okay. It is November 16th. It's another day in paradise. Uh, fall has landed in Texas. And Thanksgiving is next week. And uh, time flies. It's almost the year is almost gone. We have two uh, great guests today. We're uh, starting a new ritual. Uh, maybe it's uh, a new thing. Don't know. But before we get rolling, we're going to ask our own John Sibley Butler for some music. For all the girls I've loved before. We travel in and out my door. So glad they came alone. I dedicate this song to all the girls I've loved before. And to all the girls who shared my life, who are now someone else's wives. You live within my heart. You will always be a part of all the girls I've loved before. Right, Johnny. Johnny. The other thing that excites me about November is the basketball season has started. So I, behind me, have the Allen Fieldhouse, the fog. We are the national champions, and we're going to repeat this year. It hasn't been done for a while. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Now I see shaking heads already. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, so in any event, uh, uh, let, let's just let me say hello to Johnny and start that way. Johnny, how are you, sir? I'm fine. I just hope my Longhorns beat Kansas in football this weekend. But you know, here in Texas is is great weather, and uh, the political stuff has kicked in over the entrepreneur stuff. You know, in Texas, the state is run base, basically by merchants uh, rather than uh, the state government, and so it is quite interesting uh, to see. Uh, all of the uh, different election results coming in uh, for the midterm. And then last night, our ex-president said that he wanted to run again, and he got everybody together down in uh, in Florida, and he did his he did his thing. And of course, for the election year, there's, there's a lot of things that's interesting. The stock market is interesting. There was a rocket that flew to Ukraine. We don't know where it came from, but if it did, we might be facing a war if it came from Russia. And then, of course, there's the economic climate. And what I find about the ec economic climate, we've talked so much about it. What will the future look like? So when we talk about uh, electric vehicles and we talk about replacing the gas tax, what does that mean? So it's very interesting. But the most interesting thing is the overall economies and world structure. Not in a long time have we had so much talk about what's happening in China, what's happening in Europe and the place of the United States in doing that. And, and between it all, I'm doing lots of startups in the energy business, lots of startups in software business and the biotech area. I have really been consumed with that and CMG is getting excited. So I've been working last night with CMG on, on getting the academic articles that relate to what we're doing. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Llewellyn King, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, and uh, good to see you. I'm here in Rhode Island, where it's actually a very gray day, not a, not a, not a classic day, but we've had a very late summer. It's only just disappeared, so we have nothing to complain about. I, like Johnny, am waiting for things to happen. I have a sense that the whole world is in a the theater waiting for the curtain to go up. We're waiting to find out what's going to happen with our economies, whether we're going to get on top of inflation, what is going to happen in Britain? Are they going to be able to get out of their severe economic problems? Um, and then, of course, what is going to happen with Ukraine? And also, how long can we stable a Chinese movement to take Taiwan? That it will happen, we know. It's inevitable. Will we be prepared for it? And are we prepared to support our previous position of defending Taiwan? And that means war with China. I don't think anybody wants war. Uh, I don't know if it can be a finesse, but I imagine that there are an awful lot of people worrying and thinking about 
how it can be finesse because a war with China would be a global, terrible nuclear war. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we can have a small war. Small wars tend to get to be big wars quite quickly, which as Johnny correctly, uh, Johnny, you notice that twice I have agreed with you on this broadcast. Do not expect it to continue to happen. <laughs> Well, I'm, I am a little worried about that, but... Uh... <laughs> You're well advised to be worried. So that's the state of the world in, in some trepidation. The interesting thing is that overall economies are holding up. Not the British one, but the US economy is really doing, given the uncertainty, surprisingly well. We're beginning to show signs that inflation is slightly under control. Um, so it's, a, as John likes to say, a very, very interesting time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, we continued in this program to seek for answers on the journey of digital transformation. And we have a tandem guest team today. Uh, we're going to see how we manage this. Uh, all <laughs> I'm going to all I'm going to say to Roger and Klaus is, if you feel like the heat between Johnny and Llewellyn gets too hot, don't step in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have today Roger Skidmore, who is the chief executive officer of EDS Technologies, and Klaus Riddle. Is that is that right? Riddle. 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 Yeah. Who is the chief sales officer? And 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 you know how are you, gentlemen, doing, Roger? Doing just fine. I appreciate you guys having me on on the show and looking forward to the conversation. I'm not not, quite, not not maybe not. I'm, I'm more a day to day type of guy. So for me, I'm I'm you know trying to figure out how to get my daughters home from school and my mother in law too, or a hairdresser. But there, there are go. but there are bigger problems in the world to tackle. So we'll see. Absolutely, <laughs> Klaus. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having both of us on today. Um, I loved hearing those topics you already talked about because they they piqued my interest just as much as well. Sure, sure. So, so real quick, Roger and Klaus, and maybe you can figure out how you split answers here. So, I understand that uh, uh, you know, not too long ago or just recently, uh, 3D Digital Twin and XR announced a merger with you guys. Uh, tell us about that. So, well, actually, it was more more sister companies coming together and figuring out that their destiny actually is uh, better accomplished together than separately. So they make a long story short background here is that EDX uh, got its start way back in 1985. That's not way back in terms of a lot of people, but relative to today's you know accounting of time it was a long time ago mm -hmm. um and the company then was focused on wireless network planning uh, in fact it was the the second commercially available tool for doing that uh, back in the day um wonderful gentleman named dr harry anderson founded it ran the company um grew it uh, very successful um and then when he retired i came into the picture around 2015 2016 um, and at that point, so we identified some other initiatives that we wanted to try to undertake that would probably be better suited if it wasn't under just purely a wireless networking umbrella. And that was kind of focusing on um, augmented reality, mixed reality, um, and then ultimately digital twinning type of technology. So we actually split the companies at that point in time so that they could kind of explore life and have oxygen and do their own thing separately. But along the path, we kind of found out that, hey, it, the, at the core, they're actually solving the same problem. They're just coming at it for you know particular market directions that are are relevant to their particular business focus. But at the core, you know the the core technology there, there's huge amount of synergies there. And so putting the companies back together again under one roof, um, accommodating that is kind of what we've we've undertook uh, this year, and uh, that's. That's where we're at. So now we've got the companies awesome. back together again. Three digital twinning is our focus, and we're off to the races. Awesome, awesome. So real quick, for those that don't know, Roger, Roger is again the chief executive officer of EDS Wireless for a while now. I guess the current incarnation, prior incarnations. That, uh, um, he was a principal at AT and T uh, as a uh, technical architect. He was also a solutions architect at Motorola, and then I. I'm I'm kind of curious about you know this. He, he was the founder of Wireless Valley Communications, and the only company that I know of that name brings a name to my mind called Ted Rappaport. I think I've heard of him. 
Okay. Yeah. Yes. Ted and I, Ted's actually one of my, one of my best friends and, and mentors in life. Um, he mm -hmm. was my academic advisor when I attended uh, University of Virginia Tech. Go Hokies. Well, we're and, not going to hold that against you. That's all right. Oh, hey, we're, we're at least two and eight in football this year. We're doing, not doing too bad. So the, um, he and I, 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 I'll spare you the, the, story of how I actually bumped into him but yeah. we ultimately got together and founded a company called Wireless Valley Communications and that was yeah. my that's where I got my start in industry and it's been a rocket ship ever since. Awesome awesome Ted Rappaport you may recall John Butler was a professor for a while at UT he came from Virginia Tech and then he moved to uh, NYU and he's now at NYU I believe and he's uh -huh. a he's a dear friend of mine uh, I actually happened to uh, help him uh, in his, his spiritual journey. Uh, he's a good Catholic, and uh, and we used to hang out and do all kinds of things. So, well, you know, I I know Ted when I was director of IC Square, mm -hmm. IC Square fellow guy, and I know when uh, he argued with the university about where the technology come from, Virginia Tech and the University of Texas. He was one of my dear, dear, dear friends, and I hated to leave him to leave the University of Texas at Austin. But he's done a great job, and he he ran our wireless uh, lab for years. Yeah, yep. he, he created the whole, you know. Yes, you know, he created the whole deal. That's right. I know, I know him well. Tell him I said hello. Tell him his mentor said hello. I will. The guy who made him what he is said hello. <laughs> I'll make sure. I'll make sure he knows that. <laughs> in addition, in addition to Roger, we have Klaus Riddle, and and Klaus um, is again the chief sales officer, EDS Technologies, and Prior to EDS, he um, was with um, um, Tango Health and Vistel and Comprehend Systems and Centricity and Cognio and others. Uh, and lucky for you, John Butler, Klaus happens to be a Bachelor in Electrical Engineering in a Longhorn. Good. Longhorns. Hook them. Good. So that you with EPS, we had a great long horn who swam for us that ran that company for years. <laughs> That's right. So, gentlemen, we talk here a lot about digital transformations. We focus on telecommunications, all all flavors of Internet of Things. Obviously, five G. There's a a new release of of uh, uh, from the three GPP on that. And 6G is coming up. And uh, you probably know that, you know, at Texas State, I run all these labs and we have all these networks and LoRa networks and CVRS networks and private LTE and 5G and all kinds of things to do an experimentation uh, with the coverage from South Austin to North San Antonio. Uh, and, and, uh, and also we talk about smart cities and smart utilities and buildings. So, Tell us real quick, uh, who is your traditional customer? Traditional customer for EDX would be someone that wants to design, deploy, and manage, and run, operate a wireless network. Um, that's where the company got its start, and still to this day, that's where probably our core market focus is. So any 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 company, any technology. Yeah, the, the signal, the the core products that we have, uh, the Signal Pro design product, the Cloud Study Engine, those are all focused on. It's like a Swiss Army knife. Whatever technology you're looking to use, whatever technology you're looking to deploy, mm -hmm. there's something in there that's going to make it make your life easier in terms of getting that task done. So so let me let me help the audience uh, kind of uh, hone in into that because we're going to talk about something really important. Uh, so. This is not your AT&T network. This is not your Verizon network. This is your own private network that you're gonna build as an enterprise. Utilities do this, the railroads, oil and gas companies do this. And I think more and more and more and more companies are gonna really turn their way into these, including government agencies. For example, I've said all along that um, autonomous vehicles need to happen in private networks controlled primarily by the Department of Transportation and when you think about how we go from a few billion things connected to 300 uh, or a thousand billion things connected, it's not possible that the commercial networks can carry all that traffic securely and efficiently. So, so give us a sense, Roger, and maybe Klaus, on your pipeline and 
who 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 are you calling on or who's calling on you i mean what's happening in the us how many <laughs> how many networks are being built i mean give us a sense of that i mean is it is it is it like you get a project once in a blue moon are you do you have calls for licensing your software every two days a month or, or what's it look like no we uh I, I i should have brought you the nice charts of daily usage of our of our solution set worldwide at this point in time uh it's it's a uh, it's certainly increasing uh and there's a sense that that you know with the advent of cbers and, and private 5g that there's going to be a lot of acceleration in terms of new work so to speak for people that are designing deploying what i would call professional wireless networks at this point in time so from edx um before i came along the company made a, a very strategic decision to really invest heavily into um supporting what you know what at that point in time would have been a niche technology like meshing and you mm -hmm. know what eventually evolved into laura and those type of technologies back when that was kind of like you know the main operators and players weren't dealing with those spaces too much but edx decided to invest in it fast forward to today and you know Every smart metering network is deployed and worldwide is using that same basic technology. So we, you know, to a certain extent early on, I can say we kind of stumbled into having a very critical role to play in that space because we now, you know, are involved with, it's safe to say the majority of, of smart metering, smart city type of network deployments. And then we feel like that the, you know, forthcoming wave of private 5G and, and CBRS rollouts you know, um, we'll kind of ride on that same basic type of technology, same basic type of mindset for deploying a solution set. Um, and so I think that's going to be, I hate to say the next big thing, but in terms of wireless and where a lot of interest and focus is going to be domestically in the U.S., those technologies are going to be where it's at. Okay. So, so Klaus, don't get in trouble with Roger, but how is the pipeline looking? <laughs> well, like like Roger mentioned, you know, since we just recently merged the companies together, you know, if you look prior to that, um, the EDX wireless side, I don't know, has hundreds of customers, right? And he mentioned, you know, almost all the utilities in the U.S. use the software. On the EDX technology front, you know, we're we're two merged we're merged again, but from the technology point, you know, the end customers can be utilities, public safety, anyone wanting to do a digital twinning environment for. Um, for wireless deployments, you know, you could have people, you know, like people like American Tower, uh, mm -hmm. people who want to have a twinning aspect of all their assets, right? Wherever they are, you know, all sectors of the tower being covered, creating a twin for that. Um, so, so from that perspective, you know, it could be anybody. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the people like, you know, Helium, Helium Networks, the, those new people who are trying to make the LoRa and the 5G owned by the people, right? Mm -hmm. um, who are doing, you know, 5G CBRS as well. Mm -hmm. so, class is going to say that. So last, like, last question to set the stage for these guys to drill into you. So, so you know, there seem to be, uh, you know, enterprises building all private networks to manage their own assets. There's also a big push from Sigfox and Everynet and many other companies trying to build a carrier type concept on these different technologies across the globe, right? And what would you say is the stage of maturity or sophistication of Internet of Things? I mean, are we, is this like the first inning of the ball game? Uh, are, are we in the third inning? Where are we in kind of terms of what's happening? At the top of the third inning. It's uh, you're getting into the you're kind of still in the middle of the wild west phase i think from my perspective um there's not a lot of uh, consistency in the way people are approaching things um and so i think it's going to you know lend itself to uh, a lot of activity and a lot of hits and misses over the next probably decade as this tech type of technology matures i do think that you know a huge amount of the Internet of Things space the EDX gets involved in winds up being things like IoT sensors and just monitoring activity, you know, collecting data. Um, and so, you know, it's it's becoming less about deploying those sensors as it is about maintaining them and how you back all that data and what you do with that ever increasing mountain of data that these sensors provide. Uh, but underneath all of that underpinning is just the assumption that that wireless network is just going to magically work. Um, right. and doesn't always work that way magically, but uh, it's still evolving. 
Got it. Gentlemen. Yes, Roger. Let me ask you this. I think you you guys have come a long way from the wireless Titanic. <laughs> the wireless on the Titanic and the technology mm -hmm. has certainly evolved. And, you know, I think it's very interesting because when, when everybody that used wireless, and let me just talk about the, the Titanic effect or where people are still complaining. And whether it's uh, football stadiums, whether it's baseball stadiums. So I was at I was at home in a game, and uh, we are eight and one. I'm an LSU Tiger, go Tigers, eight and two, I think. And I think that the that the quote sore spot now, where everybody complains, is not necessarily business enterprise, but it's large gatherings like Memorial Stadium, like Yankee Stadium, and some have done extremely great jobs because people like to text, they like to take pictures and et cetera. I just want to know, given wireless technology and how close it is, what are the, first of all, the technical problems with 100,000 people trying to get on a network? And then how do you see it in the future or can it ever be solved? And if it can be solved, I will send you to Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge since I'm on the financial, <laughs> National Financial <laughs> Committee to solve it there. Uh, I will say those types of problems are what EDX widow water solutions are intended to be used for. Yes. The, 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 uh, there's a bit of a, uh, of a chasing your tail problem to a certain extent because people tend to design to solving the problem of today without realizing that within two years, you know, there's, a, there's an ever increasing amount of data that's being sent over wireless networks today. So, you know, the average, average usage today for like a 5G user, well, five megabits, something around those lines 6g looking a decade in the future you're talking 10 gigabits so that's a huge amount of increase in data and so it's sort of as soon as you give people the ability to to access a better communication pipe or send more data they're going to try to send more data than the, the pipe was actually designed to do so uh it's a constant state of you know, how do you continually to invest in improving that infrastructure to meet the ever increasing demand for, you know, services and technology that is going to be deployed on it. Um, and, if, and if you roll back and you look at what, you know, the, the, the major paradigm shift when you went from 3G to 4G and the types of things that 4G and LTE brought to the table, you know, you suddenly had, you know, it, it made entire industries like Uber, and, and those type of, of, you know, ordering from Amazon from your mobile phone, it made that that type of thing a reality. And it really moved the needle forward in people's expectations of what the network can do. And now you're in the age of continually streaming video. And it's not just a voice call. It's, you know, streaming video call that people are making. Um, and I was at the uh, Giants game just this past weekend. And you, know, you look around the stadium and you see people holding up their phone and streaming the video out while they're, they're talking to their, you know, the people that they're making fun of because they're not at the game. And so these networks have to continually be able, you have to, it's almost a continual investment you have to make in those networks to keep it uh, up to date. And as soon as you're done, it seems like you have to start all over again because the so, use cases. So in other words, when, I, when I say I want to go to the Longhorn game to watch the LSU game on, on my wireless. Good luck. And then you just say good luck. So my question is, I mean, is there any evolving technology that can that can uh, grow organically as the needs are done, much like a, a, a technology or a learning systems in a, when we do algorithms? So where we are now in technology, I think, is that uh, when you have these kind of systems, it learns and it grows by itself. Now, I'll be happy to, to uh, do a consulting job to teach you boys and girls down there. <laughs> On, on how to do this, but do you do you have it in your system where it grows organically and it automatically expands, much like we do with the learning, with with the learning uh, uh, software? Uh, there's still limitations on you know the the you, you're fighting laws of physics to a certain extent. Uh, you can you can compact information and and compact information and squeeze it into certain frequencies, but ultimately how much information you can send is going to be gated by how much available bandwidth and spectrum has been allocated to that system and and then how that that spectrum is divvied up amongst everybody that's trying to access the system. So you're still you know fighting what the technology has been made available and how the technology is what frequencies it's using, how much bandwidth is available to the system, how many simultaneous users there are um you know, you're still fighting that regardless but there are a lot of um 
investments can be made and are being made in analyzing, particularly machine learning and AI type of algorithms that say, at this moment in time, what can I do in terms of adjusting configurations of you know the equipment I have to work with here so that I can more effectively make sure that, that Johnny can watch the LSU game if he needs to. You know, those type of systems I think are becoming uh, more and more to the to the fore in terms of what they can bring and the value they can bring. And I think it's actually a fundamental underpinning of the thought process going into, you know, the next generation into 6G is how can those algorithms and that solution step uh, lend itself to improving the overall user experience, no matter yeah, what else is going on. The broadband is a function of, of, of the algorithm uh, of algorithm and what the people use. And if that if that's all automated, uh, then it'd be actually dynamic. And so I think that if you look at if you look at the wireless, of course, before that it was the airports. Airports. <laughs> <were working. laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think there there's always this uh, you know, the the utopia of a of spectrum sharing and just having all the spectrum be available for use and the system kind of navigates you to you know, whatever free spot of the spectrum is been made available. Um, that can work, but there's a lot of governmental oversight and framework that would need to have to be adjusted to, you know, enable that. Um, today, you know, if you look at the U.S. spectrum chart, it's a pretty busy little diagram. And so mm -hmm. making that available in wide enough chunks to where you can actually, you know, do, you know, full shared spectrum access and then navigate people to whatever is best for them at this moment in time, um, uh, there's going to be some work to do to make that a kind of a reality, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. The biggest complaint is I could not text my friends. It took so long. I could not get them. <laughs> I've sitting, been there. Or, yeah. or I sitting in the game at the University of Texas. Thank you, sir. Let me ask Klaus a question. Can you guys see me? I'm having technical problems here. I can just see one window at a time. No, we, we, we see you perfectly, Lou. Oh, well, that's, that, that should be perfect. That should cheer Johnny, Johnny up a lot. I wanted to go <laughs> off, but I knew he would be so hugely depressed and miss me so much. Um, I, I have a question for Klaus. It seems to me, in my experience as a, uh, as a business reporter, that there are two kinds of companies, pull and push. A pull company is one that has something that everybody wants and they're lined up to get it, and that's a very fortunate position to be in. A push company is one that is telling people, you need what we've got, try it, you need it, you want it, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. How would you categorize your company? Is it in a pull or push mode? Well, it's it's a little bit of both, right? So um, the wireless aspect or the um, products that we sell, that's a pull, right? Everybody needs them. Um, there's a lot of deployments going on, the advent of 5G, you know, um, private 5G, like Andres was talking about. There's going to be there's there's going to be a pool on that side. On the um, digital twinning, that is a little bit of both, right? There's pull and there's push. A lot of people think that it's a nice to have, you know, creating an augmented. So, for example, if you have a twin and you have field workers who want to view their assets, their their assets in the field. Um, some people still think that that's something that maybe it's a nice to have and not a need to have. Um, and they're, they're have, they haven't grasped sort of the ROI, they're gonna get out of safety, effectiveness, being able to get more done um, in their environment, having, having you know, a tool set of having augmented reality inside of digital twin. I'd like to have a follow-up question. We're suddenly talking about 6G, but as I understand it, 5G is hardly deployed, that it comes essentially in three tranches, the first one of which is being deployed now, then there's a second stage, and then a third stage. I've seen this express the slice. Uh, we haven't yet seen anything like the full effect of 5G. Uh, is it really time to be discussing 6G, and what will it do for us that 5G will not do? Well, the, the future is always bright and shiny, right? So everybody likes to talk about what's what's coming out in the future versus what you have today. No, no, I look I look backwards. I think the past, <laughs> the past is totally wonderful. I like well, the black telephones. They were just perfect. I like steam typewriters. I never needed yeah. an electric typewriter. I certainly didn't need a computer. Uh, so I'm not a good person to have on this program. And I suspect this will be my last appearance having said that. 
Um, however, uh, go ahead. Tell me, why do we need six? Uh, so I'm uh, I'm actually going to probably surprise you and say that I, I also tend to think that that there's you know a little bit too much talk about six G when there's actually more practical deployments of five G to be done. To to maybe blow your minds a little bit, if you actually start looking at wireless network deployments, new wireless network deployments on a global basis. Um, there's still large parts of the planet, large percentages of population, global population, that are just now getting 3G coverage for their for their wireless network. So this is something 6G. When we talk about 6G, we're really talking about technologies that um, uh, are still being defined at a standards level as far as how they're going to operate. They're still being defined in terms of you know how you can actually deploy these systems and and what they're going to mean when you do it. The realities of today are that uh, 5G is still very much in a rollout perspective. The the advent of private 5G and being able to leverage kind of spectrum sharing and CBERS for those type of instantiations uh, is certainly going to be a accelerant for 5G adoption, uh, which is why I think there's so much attention and energy being poured into it. You can argue that relative to the economic impact of 4G, that 5G has not had the same type of impact economically uh, in terms of, of improving, you know, creating new businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so to a certain extent, you could argue that 5G relative to 4G is a little bit of a disappointment economically from a global economic perspective. Um, but this, you know, this thread of private 5G and, you know, offloading the cost of the deployment onto the private enterprise and but then given that private enterprise the advantages of having this wonderful technology they can use uh, as an accelerant to the technology also lends itself to saying maybe there is still a lot of uh, legs left with 5g in terms of its impact from an economic point of view and a business accelerant point of view in the marketplace and so I think that for the foreseeable future, 5G, particularly private 5G, is going to be a huge amount of attention point put towards it. It's nice to have the conversation about 6G. You have to be planning for it. You have to be understanding what that future is going to bring. Um, but a lot of cases, the realities of my day-to-day -day life at EDX is 5G is the, the mantra of the day, so to speak. Roger, um, uh, if we do go to 6G, Will a lot of build-out be required? I mean, we've had a lot of build-out on 5G. Do we know what sort of build-out would be required on 6G? Uh, yeah, it starts hitting the, 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 it goes to 11, as they say. So the, um, the, uh, I just got back from the Brooklyn 6G Summit in New York with Ted Rapport up there. And, um, you know, the going, the going thread of estimation is that 6G is going to require equipment on the order of every 300, 400, 500 meters. That's a level of equipment densification that's astronomically more expensive than what 5G was deployed at. And, and so, you're running into social opposition. Yes. Already it, uh, people were wondering about the towers in New York. <laughs> they hadn't been prepared for these pylons in the, in the, in the sidewalk. So the it has, it has a, a you know it impacts the entire wireless industry, but the right now there's a you know the emphasis on design and how you design the five G to to accommodate um, you know the best quality service and so forth and those metrics, you know energy put in on the design phase reaps rewards downstream. For six G at that level of densification, you're essentially almost transitioning into more of a you know a Wi Fi. I'm just gonna I've got a hole, so I'm just gonna put something up perspective on deployments. So there's going to be a much harder hurdle to cross there in terms of site acquisition, you know, contractual arrangements with landlords, you know, those sort of things are going to become much more a, a pain point, I think, in rolling out from an operator perspective, rolling out 6G. Now they may, if the private 5G initiatives really catch fire, then you can maybe offload some of that cost down onto the enterprise and the building owner itself and et cetera, et cetera. But that's still murky waters. Thank so, you. So I have I have a couple of quick questions, maybe a far a far uh, set of questions for quick answers. So, what's the status of FirstNet? And explain FirstNet real quick. FirstNet was an initiative for nationwide federal oversight to a uh, basic activate broadband communication networks for public safety systems. Um, it is. <laughs> I guess you'd say it's it is being deployed, but I don't think it's actually achieved anywhere close to the 
the levels of adoption that it uh, it was expected to to have. We still see a lot of work. Most of EDX's work in public safety is still, you know, separate from FirstNet and local and state public safety initiatives wind up being complementary to it, but not still independently run and operated and managed by the the, the local public safety initiative. Right. Hey, hey, hold on, Johnny. A couple of quick questions. Uh, another quick question. Uh, 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 Skylink satellite technologies have been around for a while since the uh, uh, case of Iridium, uh, something that one of your former companies worked on and failed at. Uh, uh, you know, the technology has been around forever. The U.S. government uses it. The GPS system runs on it. Uh, what's your take on Skylink, uh, Elon Musk, and, and, and that technology? Are you helping design any of that into the terrestrial ecosystem? Is that a hybrid solution looking forward into the future? What, what does that look like? Well, I think that in terms of granting access, uh, it's wonderful in terms of enabling people to communicate where they don't actually have the ability to communicate today. Mm -hmm. It has a, a huge amount of potential to actually impact lives globally. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, in terms of what people sitting here in Austin, Texas expect, or when they're sitting at a at a football game, expect to have in terms of you know bandwidth capabilities and what they're sending, those networks, you know, they're not going to have the latency. They're not ultimately going to have the bandwidth to be able to accommodate that. So they do run out of steam uh, in terms of what they can provide from a service point of view, um, and that's where a sufficient critical mass of customer base that is leveraging the service can be offloaded onto a terrestrial network um, and they kind of expand, get the sky and then expand down to the ground, if you know what I mean, perspective on things. So we are involved in, uh, we'll say some some extended discussions with the various companies around those lines um, mm -hmm. to, okay. to assist with that. And then and then last comment, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but the reason the Ukrainians have been able to sustain the attack from the Russians in great part, other than the fact that these people are very creative in, in technology and build their own rockets and things like that, is that Elon Musk lend them uh, frequency and satellite focus uh, to have you know eyes in the sky, uh, and 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 so the Ukrainians have their own dedicated um, you know coverage from from Skylink. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's interesting in, from from a historic perspective, but it's also somewhat um, could be somewhat concerning. I mean, the people are at least here domestically in the U.S. probably whether they think about it or not, don't realize that you know the U.S. military has its own infrastructure that does wireless communications, and they, it owns it, it runs it, it manages it, so that anywhere on the planet, U.S. military can communicate. Uh, very few other countries on the planet have the capability. And so lots of countries that need to be able to communicate with their with their personnel, soldiers and so forth, you know, they actually have to ultimately wind up piggybacking almost on commercial networks to a certain great extent. And so okay. the this is both, you know, depending on where you're coming from, this is both great. It has been it's been wonderful for the for Ukraine to be able to leverage technology, but there's also the flip side of that is uh, you know, the dangers of commercial networks being used for military purposes, so to speak, um, and how that, you know, plays out going forward in the future, I think is going to be interesting. And I think what's happened with Ukraine and uh, in Skylink here may set the tone for some of those conversations going forward. Right. Yes. And that brings me to the security. And I'm going to stick to stadiums, you know, as for example, we have a brand new arena at the University of Texas, the basketball arena, the Moody system, and everything was credit cards everything was digital so you you know everything was done on a credit card and there was hardly no cash used <laughs> yeah people mm -hmm. could, you've been there you could you could you know you go into a store it was all credit cards people going back and forth with the credit cards so when you when you look at that kind of situation and then you begin to talk about the security of financial data and separating it out as as um, data flies around what 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 kind of security software do you utilize, and how is it improving as the IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, becomes much more, the machines becomes much more sophisticated, and quite frankly, generations expect that. Uh, I think I'm gonna. I think I, I would both get myself in trouble and probably eat up the rest of your afternoon going into that <laughs> conversation. But the um, I'll I'll say it's it's a it's a problem. 
you can you can argue whether it's the wireless network problem or the infrastructure the you know once it hits the system and the internet problem it's easier for a you know a evil doer with wireless technologies today as they exist and the way they encrypt and, and monitoring what you can do in terms of parsing out what's going on conversation wise from a monitoring point of view it's easier to actually break that security once the traffic is off the wireless network to a certain extent so it's, in other words it's almost less of a concern from a security point of view today with modern uh types of communication networks for someone to try to snoop and listen in on your your credit card transaction as it it flies across the uh the stadium uh to the antenna the receiving antenna than it is to uh get that transaction off of the database that the you know the company you know the hot dog stand actually stores in their database when you ordered the hot dog it's easier to get that steal that from the hot dog stand off the internet than it is to pull it off the wireless link yeah I, yeah i didn't know that i think that's pretty interesting but, but as you know from communications with, with coaches and football to large stadiums, to large gathering places. Uh, I think that it is it is solved in other places. I think, you know, even in the yeah. room, there's more of a solve, you know, so yeah. where people gather, let's say the, the more density there is, especially for certain kinds of events, then I think the technology has to be smart and expand the network as the need comes. And, uh, and it'll be there. I'm sure it'll be there. Well, it, it's, it'll be interesting. I mean, there, there's a, Technology has evolved just so incredibly quickly um, over the past, and it's accelerating over the past, you know, 20 years. And even I'm sure that my grandfather said the same thing before he passed away. But the, um, you know, I, I look at the way that my daughters, my daughters eight and ten, the way that they approach technology. I mean, they're not old enough to understand things yet, but they already have no sense of, you know, privacy is not a thing for them or any of their friends. And the the way that they you know rush to adopt new technologies um, without any thought to you know a, a potential negative aspect to it or that sort of thing is uh, is interesting to watch. Um, like with augmented reality, we do a lot of augmented reality in my company today. Um, you know, you couldn't pay my wife to put on an augmented reality headset. Doesn't do it. Won't do it. Never will. My daughters, if they see it, they will never take it off their head. You know, it's it's part and parcel of what they do, what they expect. You know, they expect to see that sort of thing, interact with it. And so the just a general approach to technology as changing generational, the generational gap in accepted technology is increasing, widening to where it's hard for me to to say what life will be like for my daughters when they're my age. In terms of I, I, I want to uh, real quick before Llewellyn jumps in, I wanted to do some levity here. Uh, I, we were having a, uh, I was at a gathering uh, about uh, six weeks ago, and, and somebody brought an old uh, rotary telephone, and 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 it was a grown up that brought it in, put it mm -hmm. on the table, and asked a bunch of teenagers what it was. And they said, well, it's a telephone. And they say, go ahead and make a phone call. And they didn't know where to begin. They were pushing the buttons one at a time. Uh -huh. They never thought of spinning the dial. You know, I was like, it was priceless. Yep. <laughs> Andres, I, I saw a YouTube video of one of those as well. And it was like a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old brother. And, and they figured it out, but it took them like 15 minutes. That They were like, you know, <laughs> doing all sorts of things and... Yeah, I think well, the, grandmother, the grandmother I, said, hang up the phone. And they said, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I figured Luella would enjoy that. It's, it's kind of yeah, actually, Llewellyn. it's kind of interesting the, the cyclical we can, aspect we can of some hear of you, things. Llewellyn. Oh, now he's muted. You're muted. There you go. Nope. Hmm. Nope. Why are we getting Llewellyn fixed? Yeah, uh, you need to get I you need to fix that, Llewellyn. I, I took my say, slide. I took my slide route to class. Slide route <laughs> to class one time, and solved every problem. And they were astounded that you didn't have to plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> plug yeah. in your slide ruler. That's funny. It's, yeah, not, it's, it's something to be said about that. I mean, you know, things will repeat themselves. And uh, yeah, I had a, I had a, I had a student, and she said she was back to uh, with her with her uh, everyday calendar. She was writing again because she had never had a, seen a calendar you could actually write on. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 anyway, go ahead. Go ahead, Roger. You were gonna no, no, I was just gonna say it's it's uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, the even even the um, the concept of you know people say technology is cyclical. You know, TV goes wireless, wired, and yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. But privacy also seems I hadn't really thought about it till actually this very moment. But also seems to be the same thing. I mean, I, when I was growing up, you know, telephones were party lines. You right. know. You know, you anyone can just pick up the phone and listen into any conversation if you're on the party line. That's and right. if right. you if you had to make a phone call and you picked up the phone, you had to basically ask the person <laughs> that was talking yeah. if, if you could make a phone call, if they could hang up, uh, yeah. which would be a completely foreign concept to anybody today to explain yeah. how that would work. Okay. Um, and, you know, so it's I think that my kids uh, from what I'm seeing today, I think their expectation is more that wireless will be more a party line going forward <laughs> than, yeah. than private almost, at least the way they approach things at this point. We'll see. You know, don't be surprised if Facebook and any of those sites that starts that, right? So. Yeah, and, and, and for you, so many enterprises are going to depend on your technology. Uh, I mean, you know, whether or not the enterprises as, as, as automobiles become uh, electrified and we put... Um, electrification stations every 50 miles everything would depend upon the wireless enterprise now as i take a vacation mm -hmm. and, I, and i order food and you know it's very very interesting that uh perhaps the security is not on your side but on the receiving side mm -hmm. and i i think that puts a whole nother uh business enterprise for those who are receiving uh the wireless for orders because american enterprise now will fly or go on wireless and it's going to get much much more interesting and it and also of course it's in the home now and you can run into the same thing in homes and and yeah. hotels and those kind of things so uh, yeah Llewellyn is back hi Llewellyn you we can't hear you for some reason Llewellyn try try to hit your volume in your keyboard uh, turn it up on your keyboard Talk, say something. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. yes. Um, I think I know where the problem lies. Get, get closer, get closer. Okay. Turn it up. Solution, but I think I know where the problem lies. Anyway, my question to either or both of you is there are small companies and big companies, and it tends to be in the tech world that small companies get big or acquired quite soon by big companies. Uh, you don't have a lot of boutiques hanging on there decade after decade. Where is your company headed? To a bright and successful future, <laughs> wherever that may lie. <laughs> uh, a, a, every th We're focused on uh, growing the company. We're focused on meeting the needs of our customer base. We think we have a very... Uh, interesting, innovative approach to solving world's problems in a variety of marketplaces. So we're and we're only on the leading edge of actually achieving that, you know, productizing that, rolling it out. So um, I have, I like to say my entire career is basically built up to this point. I'm excited and energized in a way I haven't been in a long time about the types of stuff that we're doing at the company. And I don't envision um, anything other than continuing to grow this company and making it a success at this point in time what is your optimum company um, your customer is it a city is it a utility is it an airline what is your optimum who would you like to see come through the door this afternoon and say i want to buy i want to sign <laughs> where is the contract uh, uh that's a very interesting question so in terms of where we get um you know the the mailbox money today that's basically the, the utility marketplace and the wireless tele telecommunications marketplace so public utilities um carriers operators enterprises that are deploying wireless networks those come to our door more than anybody else can i build on that we have three thousand electric utilities fifty-two thousand water utilities um but when we say utilities we tend to think of commonwealth edison con edison uh, center point, that kind of thing, the big investor owned ones. But in fact, they, in terms of num numerical superiority, they're overwhelmed by all these small 
uh, right. rural electric cooperatives, uh, or the very large 2,000 or so public power entities. Will you be able to serve them, or will you serve only the large uh, entities? No, we made a we made a very um, con very decision on point to what you're making there um, early on when I came into the company. So when I joined EDX, the, a lot of the focus of the licensing and, and product solution sales were sold as a a high dollar perpetual license software application, which means that there's a barrier to entry. You got to have you got to be this tall in order to use our products back at that point in time. Now we've transitioned to more of a a subscription-based access model for our solution set, which means that the the barrier entry is much, 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 much lower. And so what we actually saw was um, even though we, you know, we went from two dozen transactions per year to now hundreds of transactions per month, where uh, it became easier for, you know, instead of the the carrier being a primary customer for our solution set, it was the you know, the the dad and son uh, consulting company, you know, that was bidding on a, a wireless network for a rural utility, you know, it enabled much more access to the same type of technology that had kind of been sidled off into, you know, just people with deeper pockets. Uh, and I've been that I've, that's actually a point of pride for me and what we've been able to achieve at EDX is to be able to make the solutions and what we've got from technology point of view available to many, many, many more organizations. That is very interesting to me because I've been puzzling that for a while myself. Thank you. So yes. Roger and Klaus, you guys live primarily in the wireless area network world. Uh, you, we got, you know, wire networks, fiber seems to become more and more popular, fiber to the edge, fiber to the customer. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of things going on there. It's not cheap, it's expensive. Uh, and then, you know, if you come to the sort of the local area network, you have all kinds of different technologies. And then within a house, you have Wi-Fi, you can have Bluetooth and Z-Way and Zigbee and all kinds of new technologies, Thread and so on and so on. Uh, do you see, uh, and I think your technology can accommodate all this, but do you see anything really winning or is the future look like a collage of different networks stitched together as we keep putting sensors everywhere, starting in my house, moving into the car, driving around in the city, driving across the country? This sensory is going to increase dramatically. Do you see your software, you know, designing this this hybrid networks? Is that what's happening? What, what does it look like? Yeah, I think it's going to be a uh, again a little bit of the wild west, and it's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge. And you're going to, you know, what what we've seen over the past decade has been a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to say an explosion, but certainly wireless technologies has appeared that have very niche focus, and they, you know, they apply themselves in the very niche type of markets and use cases. And but the expectation is that they will magically that traffic will bubble up into higher organizations, higher level wireless networks and, and just enable communication over vast distances. And I think that that's going to completely continue. Um, in terms of commonalities, um, you know, when uh, when 5G was first really in, still in the planning stages and in the initial rollout stages, there was a uh, John Stanky, who's now the CEO of AT&T, made a, a, an interesting comment uh, at, one, at one talk. Um, it, he basically said that that he was excited about 5G, not because of the wireless, but he was excited about 5G because it gave it suddenly, you know, gave them an excuse to deploy fiber everywhere. Because the more data you're trying to send wirelessly, ultimately has to offload onto a wire mm -hmm. for you know, for backhaul purposes. And so mm -hmm. fiber becomes a meaningful way to backhaul that data. But the more the more data that a wireless connection can handle between your phone or your device and, you know, the initial point of contact of the infrastructure, uh, more and more fiber has to be able to be deployed to backhaul just the sheer quantity of data that's mm -hmm. there. And so mm -hmm. I think a commonality across the board is um, increasing deployments of fiber everywhere coupled with um, higher bandwidth wireless communication systems, uh, connecting down into little ecosystems of different wireless networks, all kind of bouncing mm -hmm. off against each other for whatever relative activity is needed for, you know, whatever part of space you're in. 
another interesting point is that a um i was at motorola for a while when i was at motorola the um the average police vehicle had something like 26 wi-fi networks on it at that point in time different ssids so for different type of systems to connect um today i'm i'm going to i'm going to say that's probably multiplied um because each and that's just the reality of the world that we're in um, a new car today probably has its own internal network of, of sensors and systems talking to each other internally. It's providing coverage and service for the people that are riding as passengers in the car. And going forward, it's going to be, you know, transportation networks will have the car talking to other cars, talking to infrastructure. Um, you know, that's just one example. You know, your your vehicle becomes a a moving, rolling disaster area of multiple wireless networks all intercommunicating, but ultimately having to you know, get that data out into someplace else. Right. Well, look, as you look at the structure of your, of your industry, and I, and uh, I'm an investor, and I ask, who will buy you in the future? And as the industry continues to tumble and new technologies are, are um, created, with your investors, do you have the idea that the big dog will come and buy me? Is that part of your industry as it is in many in many high tech industries? And Lou Ellen kind of alluded to this. So, do you think there? Because I don't think that most people know the difference between private and public. Uh, 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 that's that's very true. So, yeah. I mean, the, there's a general sense when you're when you're doing a high tech startup company. You know, Edex has been around for a long time, but we're actually in more of a startup mode because the new products and solutions we're rolling out are you know more cutting edge and focus on R and D perspective of what we do um you know usually you've got there's four outcomes you're going to fail miserably and go out of business hopefully mm -hmm. that doesn't happen you're going to you're going to grow the company and go public well, that's that's a journey you're going to grow the company and be acquired if you're successful that's probably the most likely outcome today frankly um or you're going to grow the company and just continue on growing the company um and do your own thing that's maybe not so common these days so um you know as a as a small business owner and ceo you know it's my job just to execute and to continue driving the vision and innovate and produce products and make customers happy and deliver solutions that are going to change the world uh to a certain degree and what happens happens who are um, your competitors who do you see game warrior maybe game <laughs> On the on the wireless communication side, that wireless communication design side, those battle lines have been drawn for years before I came into the picture. So there are you know a variety of companies out there that uh, that do similar things on the design side to what EDX does. Um, but generally speaking, either geographically they're separate from us, or they focus on different parts of the wireless industry that we do. So. Um, everyone's kind of got their own little territory, I guess you'd say, sort of sort of carved out. That's not entirely true. But um, in terms of where we've expanded our focus as a business, uh, you know, we're breaking out of the mold of the, the PC-based planning paradigm where all wireless networks are designed based on your PC, somebody sitting in a closet pounding on a keyboard, into pulling up that process into more of a shared cloud-based experience to where you can merge um, as design networks going forward in time with current as-built deployments that are happening and have all that uh, technology be intermixed and intermingled in a way that you know can improve the overall operations and results, et cetera. Um, and on the digital twin and augmented reality side of the table, you know, bringing that to bear in terms of being able to capture very detailed representations of, you know, digital representations of full networks of assets and how things interconnect, um, you know, what what actually is deployed on that tower site over there sort of uh, aspect of things. And then having all that tied up into a, you know, a comprehensive solution that can, you know, solve design, current ongoing operations for management and, you know, maintenance on a network all the way to end of life and, and you know, updating the system. Um, we're a little bit of a lone wolf at this point in terms of that end-to-end -end story, which is where I think Klaus was highlighting that parts of what we do is a complete pull. People need it. And part of that story is a, is a little bit of a push for us to sell it. How we navigate those waters going forward probably will determine whether Johnny wants to buy us in, you know, 10 years or not. Right. 
And, and I would say uh, for the audience in general, and you gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know when when uh, somebody buys a system after they do a request for a proposal or some kind of com competition, uh, that the company that they hired to and the equipment that they're acquiring from Makia, from Ericsson, from you know, Itron, from Cisco, from Landis and Gear, uh, from Aclara, blah blah blah. There's a laundry list of companies that sell different technologies and. They come in, they install the equipment, and then they leave. And what happens is the guys that are left behind trying to figure out how to run this realize that this thing needs to be optimized and managed and it needs to be, you know, redesigned again because you added a new node or a tree grew or whatever. So that's that's really, you know, so EDS is more of a, you know, independent, pure play software design wireless network company that is not attached to anybody they can optimize any infrastructure from anybody and so when the net when the guys that run the network at the company need to manage the job and now they have three or four networks they're kind of like oh my god there's three networks it's a nightmare i would like to make this thing simple and so they call EDS. am i am i on the money on that that's a pretty good that's a pretty good analysis on at least on the wireless design side yeah we get right, right. We, we we take those calls and we, you know, we do our best to make those people ecstatically happy yeah so i think that ultimately you know it could be anybody who wanted to cater to that audience horizontally that would be the perfect acquirer of this company so it could be a consulting firm it could be a one of the epc guys you know they're, they're far more generic i don't think that um, you know, any of the vertical guys on, on the telecom side would want to buy them. Uh, they wouldn't get the value, the multiplier of be, not being horizontal as they go vertical. So, Well, it's uh, it's interesting also that, you know, digital digital transformation, digital twinning, uh, wireless networking space, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of it also comes down to value of real estate. Like, right. you know, and assessing assessing the value of, of uh this tower versus that tower or increasingly mm -hmm. this this rooftop versus that rooftop mm -hmm. um and so solutions like what we have can be viewed through various lenses it could be viewed mm -hmm. from the lens of mm -hmm. the you know reducing the cost what assets do i need to buy to deliver what i need from a quality service on my network to mm -hmm. ongoing management of this large network of assets that i have to maintain and keep running um but it can also be viewed from the lens of um which lease should i sign to mount this equipment or you right. know, is there how valuable you know my house has a value but the rooftop of my house independently could have a value in terms yeah. of if somebody wanted to put an antenna on top of my house um yeah. so what is that you know drilling down into that and that's that depends on a lot of factors but all those factors that it depends on from a wireless point of view are all things that edx's products yeah, mm -hmm. are designed to solve today. Yeah. So it's interesting that you you can approach that that valuation problem from a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. Last question for me: uh, How much of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, analytics is part of your tool, and and how much will it be five, ten years from now? Uh, today it's just at the leading edge cusp. I mean, the, the tools we have from, again, keeping it on the wireless, the wireless design side of the fence, mm -hmm. um, increasingly a large amount of automation at a minimum in terms of being able to say, if you mm -hmm. give, you give it, give the tool enough information, you know, in a lot of cases, it will design the network for you, or at least make a very good, excellent first cut pass at doing that, which can be very helpful when you're talking about millions of smart meters, um, mm -hmm. and rolling that out. Um, increasingly because of the prevalence of other things we talked about, you know, IoT sensor network and being able to monitor activity in the network and, and things like that. The wealth of that content and data coming back in can be utilized to reiterate on configuration of existing equipment, but can also be used to iterate on, you know, future expansion and design of the network. Mm -hmm. And so that's where having the ability to connect the dots from an AI machine learning point of view to these events happening in terms of data or load being presented to the network in terms of the result on the existing system and what worked, what didn't work, uh, will be hugely important going forward. And so, yeah. So um, it's in your roadmap. 
It definitely. And it's uh, with the, the cloud, with us pulling basically a lot of our predictive and management technologies up into a cloud-based footing, or at least a, a server-based footing versus a PC by PC based footing. That really is the, the you know, the, the underpinnings to make that a reality because you can then absorb data to scale and mm -hmm. bring true machine learning AI intelligence to bear. Sure, sure. Well, we should, we should connect again related to Texas State in the labs, in the network lab that we have. I think your tool should be there. We have, you know, students running around with, you know, uh, key sites, Firefoxes, and things like that. And let's make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should we should talk about that. Johnny, any final thoughts? Well, I think it's a, it's interesting industry industry in the center of everything for the future. Because mm -hmm. that is the future. We know that if electricity and electric cars are the future, we know they they have to communicate wireless. <laughs> Yeah. As they move down the highway and, and as, as as they are managed and as they are assessed by everybody else that's work that's working with them. So it is a great industry. And for the telephone situation, let's get the stadium fixed. <laughs> <laughs> give us a call. Have have the stadium right. give us a call. We'll get to work on that. Llewellyn, did we lose you? Well, I can you hear me because I Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Your last you question. Anyway, I think this is all totally fascinating and would one of you come over and fix my computer please <laughs> i'll send my I'll send, uh, I have enormous technological <laughs> skill and i have enormous need ergo it's a full situation i've got to I've, I've got to go pick up my daughter from school i'll, I'll swing her by and let her take a look at it <laughs> anyway uh, it's very very interesting i'm also very interested in how all these small utilities will get private networks, which has not here before been explained to me by people offering rather expensive, complex networks. I also would, uh, so I think it's very, very exciting. I think it's very interesting. And I think basically that is a pulled situation as far as you're concerned. Uh, I'd love to talk about it more and maybe even to write about it. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back any week. I could talk about this stuff with you guys all day. Bring, you here. bring a new computer. I bought a new <laughs> one. I, uh, is, I wanted to say about that rotary phone. As a young reporter, of course, I used a rotary phone. If you've got to make 30 phone calls, which is not impossible, uh, it's a lot of work. You had pencils with little things on it to try to speed it up. It didn't work. It was the finger that you had to do. Uh, so there you are. It's been most enlightening. Thank you. Johnny, take us away. Operator, why don't you help me place this call? <laughs> See the number on the map, what is on all that baby? <laughs> Living in L.A. with my best old ex friend, Ray. Yeah, she says she knew well and sometimes hated. And isn't that the way that these things go? Well, let's go get on that. She'll be the number if you can find it. So I can call just to tell them I'm fine at the show. I overcome the blow. I learned to take it well. I can't hear you, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> Linda wants you to come and be our in-house troubadour. 